He suffered a lot of things. But he also had a thorn in his side. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations. And he was talking about being transported into the third heaven, which is the heaven heaven. <clears throat> but to keep me from becoming conceited because of these great revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. A messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. You see what I'm saying? You're in that wheelchair and you can't get out of the wheelchair. And you're suffering that infirmity. God is transforming that cross of that infirmity into power. And the more helpless you are to do anything about your condition, the greater the power of the cross that he's given you. And he only gives those crosses to souls that love him very deeply and are very strong in their love for him and are willing to sacrifice, are willing to say, your will be done, Lord. If you choose not to heal me, then I understand it's not because there's something wrong with me or there's something wrong with the person that prayed for me. It's because you've given me a cross, and that cross is working a weight of glory. I can't see it, but I believe it because you said it. Um, my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. So here he was talking about his flesh. He was talking about this thorn which brought him to a state almost of despair. Three times he begged the Lord, please take this away from me. But the Lord said, no, that thorn in your side has so much power you have no idea now but you're going to see it someday you're going to see the power that that thorn was working in my in your life and my grace in the meantime is sufficient for you you don't need anything more i can imagine he was very distracted by that i mean if he called it a thorn in his side um you know it must have been pretty disturbing i'm sure that he had trouble writing he had trouble thinking he may have had trouble moving around. That's a cross. But the man was brilliant. Look what he accomplished. That wasn't him accomplishing it. That was that thorn. Plus Jesus working through him. Graces were being continually released through Paul, through his thorn, through his suffering. So this is really good news for people who are sick. Because when you feel infirm and you feel helpless, uh, you're not helpless. Now there is an exception to this I want to talk about for a moment. Let's say that you uh, go to that healing conference and you do get a healing. Two of you get a healing. And the other person doesn't. That cross stays with them. But the other two go home. And pretty soon the symptoms start to creep back in on that person, one of the people. For the other person, no, no more symptoms. They're totally freed of that infirmity. Well, here's some news. I think this is so important for us to know because this is a prayer you can pray any time to maintain your healing. There are spirits that will come and imitate and create symptoms in your body that mimic what you were just healed of. So um, these tormenting spirits are called spirits of lying symptoms. And again, bringing to mind my husband, he'll be in a situation where he's in a lot of pain. I just prayed for him 15 minutes ago, and he was totally relieved of the pain. 
So I know he was healed 15 minutes ago. Why is the pain back? So what I'll do is I'll just simply pray, you lying symptoms in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to loose him. Loose him and don't ever come back. Don't send for reinforcements. Loose him. Now, if I think there's a demon involved, I'll tell him to go to the abyss because that's what the Lord has instructed us to do. Um, you will be shocked at how you will feel better instantly. Absolutely shocked and amazed that your peace is restored and your body's restored and you feel good again. I mean, can you believe it? Just by praying a simple prayer, you lying symptoms. I was healed. I command you in the name of Jesus to loose me and don't ever come back. And then all of a sudden, you feel fine. It's no mystery. We're surrounded in the second, in the second heaven by the demons. And the first heaven down here where we are, the air, the spirits of the air, we're surrounded by them. They can't do anything to us without the Lord's permission. But um, they really love to make a Christian lose hope and lose their healing. And so what I'm saying here is that you can take authority over those demons the minute you recognize that your symptoms are returning. You know you got a healing because your symptoms lifted off when you were prayed for. And now they're starting to creep back in. Take authority over them right then and there and command them in the name of Jesus to loose your body. And pay attention because, they'll, you know, they'll try to come back. These are things that will really, you know, really help us understand the dynamics of healing and the dynamics and the economy of salvation. Every single person on the face of this planet has a part to play, has an important part to play in the salvation of souls, whether they are aware of it in their intellect or not. There are things going on in the spiritual realm that we are involved in that we have no clue about. But they're still happening. There are amazing things going on. To tell you a little story here, we knew some folks. A man was uh, had been in Vietnam, and he was an alcoholic. And one day he confessed to us the thing that caused him more torment and more pain, and caused him to um, to drink. And my heart was just rent for this man. So I, I prayed and prayed and prayed. And, um, well, what had happened, actually, is that he was standing guard at a post in, in Vietnam. And a woman came in with a basket. She was going towards the uh, kitchen and to take some things there. And she gave it to her little boy. And she said, you know, go take that into the kitchen. And she immediately turned and ran in the other direction. And and the man saw this, and this huge bomb went off, killed the little boy, killed everyone in the, uh, in the kitchen, in the dining area. And this, this horrible, horrible thing has haunted him his life long. So I went to prayer for him, and the Lord showed me something. I'll never forget this. I, I saw, I was in New York City near Central Park, and there was a little boy who was a child of um, drug addicts, didn't know who his father was, his mother was an addict, and a prostitute. And this little boy was so lost and so confused and in so much pain. And he went into Central Park and... Um, he had a little striped T-shirt on, horizontal stripes, red and white, dirty, had dirty jeans. He went into Central Park, and he was by one of the ponds there. And I saw the Lord Jesus standing there, and he came and he held the little boy, and they talked for a while. And then in the next scene, the little boy left, and he was crossing the street, and he was hit and killed by a truck. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, that little child, that soul, 
had an agreement with me to offer his life and to come live in heaven with me. Before he was born, he knew. His spirit knew the conditions he would be born into and that he would not live out his days, but that God would rescue him and take him out of that situation. Now, there, there's some people who probably won't believe what I'm, what I'm relating to you, and that's all right. I understand. Take it to the Lord. You know, we always have to discern the spirits. But what I was given to understand is that the soul, apart from the intellect, the spirit, apart from the intellect, was very, very aware of the circumstances of the life that God was giving them. And he knew that he was going to be taken out of this misery. And he knew what the misery was. And now he's in heaven. I mean, there are things that go on, people, in the spirit realm that are out of this world. I mean, Disney has nothing on God. And God's ways are not our ways. You know, turning to Isaiah, I love this scripture. We quote it all the time, Isaiah 55, 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And the New Living Translation, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Philippians 3.18 Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And what's heaven's agenda? Salvation and sanctification. That's our homeland. So, you know, the Lord said, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Don't worry about what you're going to wear. That's what the pagans run after. Rather, seek first the kingdom of God and the things that you need. All those other things will be added unto you. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, Paul says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And 1 Corinthians 3.18, another scripture, Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, the naysayers, you know, oh, that couldn't have happened. I mean, that's just, you know, that's make-believe. That's a made-up story. He should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. 